Today's special guest is a member of the Human Trafficking Task Force of Kentucky, where she was appointed by the then Attorney General, Governor Andy Bashir. She has served 21 years as a deputy sheriff in Hardin County. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Miss Bonnie Wheeler to G3. Hi, this is Betty Baye, and welcome to the third season of the G3, Good Grief, Good Gossip, Good God. And let me introduce my co-hosts as we partake of a very serious topic tonight. Letty Johnson, <laughs> give us a wave, baby. That's my co-host. And also Gwendolyn Brashear, our other co-host. And Gwen is going to lead this discussion tonight about a very serious topic. So Gwen, bring us in. Thank you so much, Miss Betty Valle. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so happy to have you here with us today. We have some amazing things to talk about, some important things to talk about. So grab your loved ones and spend the next 30 minutes with G3 as we equip you with information that could save you and your loved ones from the atrocity called human trafficking. Now, Miss Bonnie, we are so <laughs> glad to have you. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, and I look forward to sharing information on the topic of human trafficking, and hopefully one day we can put an end to this atrocity. Amen. So, Bonnie, we're going to jump right into this. One voice, one mission to end human trafficking. This topic may sometimes make us feel helpless, but please remember we are strong and together we have the power to change the world. The G3 goal is by the end of this episode, we will equip every single soul listening with tools to help combat human trafficking. We hope that you will be informed and recognize indicators of human trafficking and tactics used by traffickers that you will be inspired to help raise awareness for our community and our children. That you will be intentional in using your voice to protect those who have been victimized and reporting any possible injustice. Knowledge is power. And today we put our power to work together for good. Now, Miss Bonnie, what is human trafficking? So according to the federal government, human trafficking is defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. Sex trafficking is severe forms of trafficking in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not yet attained the age of 18. Victims are any person. It matters not the color of your skin, your age, your socioeconomic class, Thing. Just like cancer, human trafficking affects each and every one of us. When I was growing up, I lived with my mom um, and my dad wasn't really in the picture and she struggled with drug addiction. Um, my mom was diagnosed with cervical cancer. I ended up living with my stepdad and me and my stepdad, we didn't really get along. I mean, after my mom had passed, it got into physical fights and my teacher was just asking me what was going on and he's like, I, I, I don't know what to do besides call CPS. One of these girls approached me, like, I know that you're not in a good place right now. Do you want to come stay with us? We walked to her house. 
Um, and I met her boyfriend, and her boyfriend was named Joker. And there was about four or five other girls living in the house with us. And I just thought they were all friends, and everybody just kind of lived there. And he was just really cool. And he was. He was super nice. He let me live with them. He would take me out to the movies. He would get my nails done. He'd do my hair. Like, and I felt so great. He just kept telling me all the things that I needed to hear. You know, I didn't have family at the time, and he told me that he'd be my family. And he told me that he'd be there for me. And those are the things that I needed to hear. And, but there was this one day where he had asked me. He was like, we're about to go somewhere. Do you want to come with us? From that moment, I feel like I started to understand what was going on. So we go into this hotel, and there's another man in there. And Joker's, you know, Joker gets the money from him. And I watch her undress. And I watch her have sex with him. And he had told me, like, you know, these are what these girls do. And he's like, I'm not asking you to be a part of this. I'm not asking you to lay yourself down with these men, but I am asking you to sit in on all the appointments that we have from now on. From that moment on, I went on every appointment with those girls. And that's when I started getting into drugs really heavy because no one wants to do that sober. I don't like that people are so closed-minded to it. They're like, no, it doesn't happen, that's only in other countries, it only happens over there. They just need to realize that it is happening here. Sex trafficking is international, but in the U.S., 40% of the victims of sex trafficking are African-American. Perhaps what the sex traffickers understand, including the glorified pimps, is that black lives matter less. We know that it is real and that it can take many forms. But how many of these missing African-Americans that we don't know what has happened to them maybe got swallowed up in this human trafficking drama because people are not being found. We don't know where they are. We used to call it back in the day, pimps. Pimps are human traffickers. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. To the world, he was the king of R&B. To his victims, he was their worst nightmare. The jury delivered a powerful message to men like R. Kelly. No matter how long it takes, the long arm of the law will catch up with you. Accused of masterminding a decades-long criminal enterprise, the jury found Robert Sylvester Kelly guilty on all nine charges of racketeering and sex trafficking. In the six-week trial, prosecutors described an environment of torment and abuse dating back to the early 90s. They said the Grammy Award winner used his fame to prey on the young, running a network of employees and close associates to recruit women, underage girls and boys for sex. I did do some research on R. Kelly, just some reading and so forth. What amazed me was how long ago it actually started. And then to know that for years, a number of ladies, young ladies, fell victim to R. Kelly and other entertainers. But sadly, it was kind of swept under the rug. I mean, he's an entertainer. Who would think? You know, these young ladies obviously wanted to be with that. Um, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Sadly, it's taken, what, how many years to come to the point that he was actually convicted of human trafficking? You know, and that's what we see. We saw it with Jeffrey Epstein. We see it. There's a number, again, of entertainers who fall into this crowd of human trafficking and utilize young adults because the entertainment factor, the celebrity, the ooh, ah, they're so great. Uh, when reality is that they're getting themselves into these situations that they don't realize what they're getting pulled into. Right. We can see that in the case of one of R. Kelly's. Uh, victims. Mm -hmm. um, she is now talking about, she has come on the other side of that. But she oh, said, true. I think Gail King asked her, you know, what could have been done to get her out of that situation? And she said nothing, mm -hmm. nothing, because she was so deep into it and she did not see herself as a victim. So there was nothing that anybody could have said. She said, in fact, if somebody had come on her and said that he was a trafficker, she would be more defensive about her situation. But she is now on the other side. But the point is, is that when she was into it, she would not even have accepted what help from anybody because she, she did not see herself as a victim. 
Jeronda Pace was 16 when she was abused. I was a victim of sexual abuse, mental abuse, and physical abuse, all at the hands of R. Kelly. The high-profile trial was one of the first of the Me Too era, where a large majority of the accusers were black women. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I gave y'all 30 years of my hell. His fate will be sealed in May, when his sentence is due to be handed down. The punishment he could face life in prison. I appreciate um, Sister Bonnie so much your um, your definition of what human trafficking is. But can you, for us, can you paint a picture as to um, really what that looks like in terms of um, the action that is taking place? Because I think that because R. Kelly is a glamorized celebrity, I don't think that people really understand the luring process that that took place in terms of um, really captivating um, the, the, the victims. You're right. The glamorization from the celebrity standpoint, most of us are not going to experience that. When you think about everyday situations, so we talk about luring or grooming. Take, for instance, a young lady or even a young man with low self-esteem, with maybe the broken homes and things like that. Youth that want to feel wanted, they want to feel like they have some sense of acceptance from somebody. So they have all these different tactics of isolating these young, young men and young women. They learn about their family, their siblings. They know their likes, their dislikes. They learn what these kids may want to do as they age. You know, are they going to go to school? Are they from split families? What's their careers going to be? Maybe they're saying, hey, we're going to I'm going to send you where you can model or you're going to be a movie star again, glamorizing it. So before you know it, you might have what we call a Romeo boyfriend. You have an older boy or girl that's taking interest on someone. Well, they cater to them. They're buying them gifts. They're treating them nice. They're good to them in ways that they've never encountered, maybe in their families. So that's how they're kind of luring them away. They learn about them. Then they treat them like they love them, kind of uh, develop this bond, if you will. Once they lure them away from families, then they start into that, well, we can't afford to live. You're going to have to help. They might be introduced to maybe the dancing industry. So they have all these different tactics of making these young, young men and young women go with them and feel obligated, if you will. Most of the times they don't realize what's going on. They don't see that they're being victimized until they've been isolated from their friends and family. They're not going to school. Uh, they've built this relationship and they don't realize until they're forced into using drugs for coping. They're forced into jobs or being pimped out or even being beaten. But they don't realize that they're a victim until it's too late.
for maybe children from broken homes, children in foster care, children who are in the court system for any type of criminal activity, divorced families, you know, families, maybe, maybe you're a latchkey kid and that might be an old term, but when you think about kids who come home every day and they come home to an empty home who the parents are working. So the kid comes home to nothing and they're looking for ways to feel wanted, feel needed, to be accepted. Um, I, when I taught D.A.R.E., I used to teach, ask my children, fifth grade students in a rural community, have any of you ever snuck out? And I was amazed to, to see the number of students that would sneak out at age 10 and 11. Oh, so when you're in a rural community and you're miles away from the city, where do you go? You know, so they're putting themselves at risk. They're sneaking out of their rooms. Their parents don't know they're there. And before you know it, they're either gone or they're involved in situations that they do not have the reality to understand that they're being trafficked. So in other words, we should be observant. We need to be observant about what's going on around us. We need to look for that person that maybe is in the McDonald's that, that they look like in their eyes or something. They're really saying help, you know, that, Absolutely. that we need to be observant and to understand that this is real and that it can happen to, to anybody. The signs are everywhere. Sometimes you just have to take a second look. Human trafficking is modern day slavery and it happens in our own communities. Victims can be any gender, age, or race. Join the Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign to learn how to recognize and report this heinous crime. Your second look could be their second chance. We have been in this pandemic now almost 18 months. What are you hearing as an advocate and as an ambassador and um, I know that, you know, probably the, the statistics have really, if we were to be honest, they probably have been skewed in many ways because there's not, there's no outlets to be able to report. What have you as an advocate, what have you heard and seen over these last 18 months? Well, of course, what I'm, what I'm seeing from my perspective now, situations like we are in a rural community. So people think, oh, it doesn't happen here. You know, that happens in big cities. But the reality of it is that rural communities, especially during this COVID time, what better place to hide out and run places or have this type of situation occurring? Um, because the kids weren't in school, so you didn't have them reporting. They had no outlet to report because of because of covid and with the nti programs with the students not being in school they're left at home with their perpetrators you know um they're left to do kind of whatever wherever whenever so they're not they're not being safe and then they don't feel like they have anyone that they can tell what's going on once school started back up um we started seeing an influx because now they're getting comfortable. They're starting to find people that they can talk to, that they can trust, that they can tell what's been going on with them. If they can even identify, they know they might have been assaulted, but they won't necessarily understand or even recognize themselves as a victim. Part of that is that if they feel like, oh, Romeo, this person that says they love me, that says they want to be with me, that they want all these things, you know, they're glassy eyed and thinking that it's this fairy tale and that this person's going to take care of them. So that bond that they're forming, they don't look at themselves as a victim. They look at themselves as, oh, I agreed to do this. I, I would say that one of the, some of the things that I found when I was researching this, because this is definitely near and dear to my heart, because I cannot imagine um, the circumstances in, and the abuse, not just the physical abuse, but the mental abuse that people suffer from for all the days of their lives, if they've ever been part of something like this. But some of the things that I've found research on that said that maybe they appear malnourished or they have signs, they might have signs of physical abuse, but things like avoiding eye contact or um, very little social interaction. And they respond in a manner that maybe, maybe feels rehearsed or scripted. 
You know, they are told what to say and what to do yeah. at all times. So scripted behavior. And yeah. then just even like in your in your travels and things like that, when someone doesn't have the right documentation of personal identifications or or if they don't have any possessions of their own, just different things that stick out as far as what a, a typical person would probably do or have or interact. When I first got into researching, you always heard more about trafficking at events such as the Kentucky Derby, the Farm Machinery Show, football games, you know, big sporting events. Because you have so many people coming in from so many different areas that it's not suspected. It's not on the surface. You're not going to know, you know, so girls get picked up in other states and then they're transported here. Nobody's going to know who they are. Um, the other side of that is maybe it's not necessarily the sex trafficking aspect, but when you're looking at the Derby and, and even county fairs or state fairs, you have people that come in and work uh, that maybe are paying a debt for being here. And they're stuck in the servitude trying to pay back a debt for being brought over here, whether it's where, wherever they're coming from. You right. know, so that's what makes immigrants, you here. Right, and that's what yes. makes immigrants vulnerable because um, many immigrants who are new here or they're undocumented or something that they get the threat that, you know, we're going to turn you in or whatever. And then some people come from cultures where there is such a thing as servitude. And, you know, so they don't they don't know any better because they had some cases of very wealthy people from the Middle East, I think, who had people here working for them, taking care of their kids with no days off. Um, you know, not paying them or threatening them, not feeding them. And they came to the United States thinking they were going to get an education and go to school. And they ended up being in servitude for years. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. And he's hop out the car with a gun, like, get in the car, get in the car. There are only victims and survivors of child rape. Child sex trafficking is alive and real in the United States. Young girls are being bought and sold for sex in large numbers. It's time for that to end. To Stop using the term child prostitute to describe child trafficking. Child prostitution. Child sex trafficking. Underage prostitution. Child sex trafficking. Child prostitute. There is no such thing. No such thing. No such thing as a child prostitute. I think it's interesting that, <clears throat> that you pulled out um, around the physical, uh, uh, the violence piece of it, um, mm -hmm. Sister Gwendolyn. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask Bonnie, um, because I I know that in a couple of articles that I read that generally um, uh, folks who are being human trafficked, generally there are not signs of physical violence. Is that true? Have you found that to be true, Sister Bonnie? Yes, in some cases, because the reality is, is if you think about it, if a trafficker were to physically abuse their victim, they can't necessarily put that victim out for sale, so to speak, because someone's going to look at that and say, hey, what's wrong with this girl or what's wrong with this young man? You know, they're not going to be attractive to them because their face might be messed up or there might be something wrong. So when you think about, you know, the traffickers, if they're going to discipline their victims for whatever reason, making eye contact with another pimp or anything, that discipline is going to be done behind the scenes, you know, and they're not going to be visible violence to them or they would if they're doing the physical violence, they wouldn't necessarily put them out turning their tricks until they've healed. Wow. That is that is I don't even have the word for um, an experience like that. And ladies, I have to say this, but we are narrowing down our time and it has gone by so quickly because there's so much information and it is so needed. I do want to hit just a couple of things before we get into our good gossip with Miss Letty. So the main thing that I take it away from this is that uh, human trafficking, it looks nothing like it does in the movies. It can be your neighbors. It can be anyone that you know, and anyone can be a victim as well. And that this is a big business. We're talking billions of dollars every year. Um, trafficking cases have been reported in all 50 states. And it is also nationwide. Um, the thing that I want you to know is that 
we're going to make sure that you have numbers that you can reach out to someone if you are in danger or if you know of someone who might be in danger. So if you need help or if you see something, there are some places that you can call, text, and reach out to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's confidential. It's toll free. It's available 24 seven and it is in more than 200 languages. The hotline has any person of any age, any religion, any race, any language, any gender identity, any sexual orientation or disability. So if you need help or you see something, please call 1-888-373-788 or text be free. That's B-E-F-R-E-E. -E. All of this information is going to be posted. We are so grateful that you took the time to share this with us. We hope that you've learned, learned and gained some valuable information that you can use. Please share it with your friends and family. Protect yourselves. Make sure you are aware of your surroundings. And we cannot leave here without having some good gossip. So if you would, Miss Lady Jo, take it away. So our good gossip today is really about why we're wearing the color blue. We wear the color blue today because we stand in solidarity against slavery and human trafficking. We want to raise your level of awareness because the reality is victims' voices lead the way. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us. And just be on the lookout for those who may be needing your help. Thank you so much for joining us today. Child predators and sexual offenders have been known to engage underage users online and invite them to chat rooms and even in-person meetings. Here is a list of apps to be aware of. Ask FM, an anonymous questions app known for cyberbullying that allows users to interact privately. Badoo, a dating and social media app intended for adults only allows users to chat and share photos and videos based on location. Best Secret Folder, a mobile app that hides password-protected explicit content, photos, and videos then provides decoy videos and alarm settings. Bumble, a dating app that requires women to make the first contact. Calculator Plus, a decoy app that hides photos, videos, files and browser history. Grinder a dating app targeted to the LGBTQ community based on user location. Hilly, a dating app that allows users to browse photos, engage in chats, send private videos and more. Hala, a video chat app that encourages users to meet people locally. Hot or Not, a mobile app that allows users to rate profiles and chat with other users. Kick, an instant messaging app that allows users to bypass traditional text messaging features. Live.me, a live streaming app that sexual predators use to earn coins to pay for photos of children online. Meet Me, a dating social media app that connects people based on location and encourages users to meet in person. MocoSpace, a social networking site and dating app that offers users to connect with teens via text messages or voice calls. Monkey, a live video chat app that connects users to strangers worldwide, offers group chat rooms and private message options. Plenty of Fish, a dating app and website that encourages chatting and browsing profiles of strangers. Scout, a location-based dating app that allows users to share private photos. Snapchat, a social networking location-based app that allows users to take and share photos and videos that quickly disappear after being seen. TikTok, a mobile app that allows users to create and share short videos. WhatsApp, a messaging app that allows texts, video calls, photo sharing and voicemails with users worldwide. Whisper, a social networking app that exposes users' locations and allows users to remain anonymous to share secrets with strangers. Zeus, a location-based dating app and website that utilizes a carousel feature that matches users with random strangers. G3 would like to give a big shout out and appreciation to Latoya Stiggers, writer for The Voice of Black Cincinnati for compiling this information. G3. Please join us for the next episode where we discuss the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks.